Yes, my background is a social scientist as well as a planetary scientist. I have two PhDs, one from the University of California and one from the University of Minnesota. I have had the opportunity to work extensively in areas of environmental science also with major universities throughout the world, and particularly with government leaders in Mexico and Brazil, uh, working with uh, Jose Lessenberger years ago, who was, shall we say, dramatic enough to indicate that if we do not control the climate situation, the oxygen lung, that is to say, of the Amazon region would be lost, and as a result, temperatures would rise. And I'm Dr. Desiree Gertek. I'm really an environmentalist. I've worked a lot with public policy in trying to change the way people think, and I'm so happy about the finally scientists around the world are starting to say, we have a problem with our climate and we need to make a difference. And this is part of my work for years. We've worked at the United Nations at many of the uh, major conferences, Rio Plus 20. We also did work uh, with the ozone studies over the South Pole when we did special work with the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is affiliated with NASA, looking at the critical situation that was faced in the 19, late 1980s and 90s about uh, just how the byproducts of industrial society are destroying that protective layer we call the ozone layer around Mother Earth. And this is really what some environmentalists are concerned about because if the Arctic region and the Antarctic region have rapid melt runoff, we're going to see uh, basically oceans rising, not one meter, but several meters For CO2, by the end of the century. Our CO2 levels right now are the same as 15 million years ago. This is about 400 parts per million, which is really high. They've been studying it from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii since 1958. And it started about 320 parts per million. Now we're over 400. We're actually 401. They don't think it'll drop because the trend is going up. And this affects everything. And if you go back to the Miocene period, which is when the carbon dioxide levels were at that high, you had high sea level rise. You also had higher temperatures, two to three degrees on the Celsius scale and three to six degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. So you had quite a different environment at that time. If we're going into that environment right now, we really need to prepare for it. And that's part of the work that we're talking about at the Water Conference. And we brought several charts with us from the Intergovernmental Agency that looked at climate change trends that we're going to pop into this short interview so people can understand what we're facing as a global society. Well, Brown's gas is something that's been talked about since, we'll say, the 1960s. There was a man named William Rhodes who started the idea. And then Yul Brown, which is where Brown's gas gets its name, uh, started to work on this really, also in the 60s to the 70s, and started to really develop this unique electrolyte structure to be able to break down water. So what it is, is you're not completely separating water like in traditional hydrogen technology. You'll divide the hydrogen from the oxygen because, you know, water is H2O. But in this case, you actually just break it apart a little bit and you uh, have both hydrogen and oxygen, both of which can be used in an engine. Now, there's been a lot of controversy, which is why this is such a fun topic. And you have people like Stanley Miller, who was running a whole car on nothing but water. We're not talking about that, although we like to discuss it sometimes with friends. But what we're really talking about is the fact that you can take this uh, Brown's gas, or what we call oxyhydrogen technology, and put it into your car. And people who do it right, actually, TV Mythbusters tried it and didn't do it, but they just threw it together. You know, they do a one part series, half hour. I mean, it takes a while. So what happens is when you get it right in your car, people are saving between 15 and 20% on their fuel. And in addition to that, the carbon emissions that we were talking about with CO2 really decrease. And so we have, yes, water vapor, no real environmental hazards. And so that's really the up note of why it's so important. Right, and so, you know, when you go in, and I know I have an older car, and I'm always concerned that it's going to pass the inspection test. And when you take these old cars in that have been retrofitted, so to speak, with a very small thing of this hydrogen brides gas, uh, really the emissions are low, 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 lower than even an average car, which is amazing. So this is a great way of keeping your car going. Now, we're not changing the entire engine. We're not running the car on gas. What we're talking about is it's almost like an air or fuel 
fuel additive. So you put it into, and they put it everywhere because some people are making these in your, their garages. And you put it into either the air intake or the carburetor or directly into the engine block actually, and it burns the whole fuel of gasoline a much cleaner and more. So you're kind of energizing the petrol that's already in your car. And so what's coming out is very less emissions. That's how it works. I remember years ago, I was a guest of Professor Winter in Germany who showed that a Mercedes Benz could run on hydrogen energy. I also was a guest at the Russian Academy of Science where we saw the Russian Tupolev aircraft run simply on hydrogen. But there were situations of cost and practical situations of refueling. So we're looking at something now that's more streamlined and uh, we're very hopeful. And this is the excitement here of this gathering, this Congress of great minds to see that we have countermeasures for the environmental crisis. Right. So if you're interested in putting it in your car, you actually can buy it off of Amazon. And uh, people are making their own little things with like scrap metals because that's, you need this dry cell. It's called electrolyte dry cell from stainless steel with rubber gaskets. It's really easy. Some people do it for less than $100. The average is $200 to $2,000. But people, you know, enjoy it. They get good mileage and it doesn't rust your car because that's one thing. Oh, putting water in our car. In fact, the most exciting thing right now is that BMW has actually taken and made a water injection engine and they're getting an 8%, which is, you know, pretty good savings on the new BMW water injection engine. So this is a little bit different from Brown's gas, but it shows that, you know, car companies, real car companies are looking at water or hydrogen, as Dr. Jack just mentioned, in moving the technology ahead and cutting em emissions. This is so exciting. This Congress brings together the leading experts in so many fields that will have the crosstalk that's missing in most Congresses where you just function on a particular discipline or theme. Here we see the environmental issues, we see the importance of hydrology, we see the importance of being more conscious of what scientific measurement is showing us. Will we survive or will we take, shall we say, a step backwards and go back several hundred years because we do not see the environmental hazards? Here we have those individuals who have hopefully the bigger picture, the bigger plan, and that's exciting.